Uh, next, I would like to uh, introduce Mazarin Benaji. Um, she is the Richard Clark Cabot, Cabo, Cabot, Professor of Social Ethics, and she has about six other titles. Um, she's past president of APS. Everybody knows who she is. Please join me in welcoming Mazarin. So I had a traditional talk with a few slides, but last night I thought that I should just tell you what I think. Um, and this morning I heard a wonderful session on the same topic uh, in which uh, Laura King, Brian Nosek, um, Sanjay Srivastava spoke, and those gave me some more ideas. So I ran off to my room and I wrote a talk, uh, which I'm gonna read to you. Um, Jeff Simpson said it was bold for me to not use slides. I think it may be just plain dumb, so uh, <laughs> please. All right, more than any other science, it is our science that has shown that we as a species are not the people we think we are. More than any other science, it's experiments in social psychology that have shown that in spite of genuine striving to be good and actual actions of goodness, we are also easily and capriciously capable of harm that our objectivity is compromised, that we are easily impartial, that we do not attend to the weight of reason. From research on social perception, social attention, social memory, as well as big things like attributions that we make, judgments we derive, decisions that we make, we have demonstrated not once, not a hundred times, not 5,000 times, but many thousands of times that we're not nearly as rational or good as our own standards and values would prescribe. So we've been talking much about specific practices okay, that will help us ensure high research integrity, which is indeed, I think, where the action lies. This morning's uh, symposium was a wonderful example of that. But I'd like to dwell on the abstract level for the next 10 minutes or so to get us to recognize again and again the enormous responsibility we have as social and personality psychologists to provide leadership on this issue for all of science. Okay. If we recognize this fully, I think that much of the hardship of achieving what we seek will just simply fade away. So after 50 years, and by 50 years I'm using Milgram, after 50 years, the single most famous experiment in social psychology, even today, remains the demonstration that good people, ordinary people like ourselves, are capable of harm of a sort that we would not only not condone in others, but would find horrifying if we were to see such behavior in ourselves. So we may ask, why do social psychologists go about studying such behavior? Why is it this aspect of human nature that shows dissociations between good intentions and less good behavior, why has that so consistently been a theme for the past 50 years of our work? It seems to me that from the very beginning, the people who pioneered the field believed in an idea that the Russian playwright Anton Chekhov captured when he said, man will become better when you show him who he is. Not tell him, but show him. Not necessarily force him to change, but just show him, okay? Um, if this is done in a non-patronizing way, if our discoveries do have that possibility, if we understand something at its core, however frightening the result might be, I think we will be able to make things better. That's what our big fat prefrontal cortex is for. But it is also incumbent on us to ask how long we're willing to wait to have every Chekhovian man come to see who he is at his own pace. In fact, in our classrooms, the hardest time we have is trying to persuade newcomers to the field that they, not somebody in another place or another time, not the person sitting at the other end of the classroom, but they themselves are likely to be prone to the errors and shortcomings that our giant amounts of data show. We try out our basic skills at pedagogy and at persuasion to get them to have a glimmer of a true understanding that they could be that average Joe in Milai or Abu Ghraib, the bystander who is immobile in a moment that demands help, the doctor who prescribed the prosthetic that her own company manufactures. We know how hard it is to persuade, truly persuade about these issues and to use the classroom to create a moment 
of what it means to live an examined life. So it's in this context with the central pillar of social psychology as the backdrop that I'd like to say something about the issues of research integrity, which like many of you have been following with interest and have viewed as an opportunity to think newly about my own responsibilities as the principal director of a lab. And I should say that um, I am not always confident that this kind of lecturing is going to work very well with us because my fear is that by imposing certain constraints that new ways of assuring research integrity could also backfire. It is also important for us to think a little bit about what a concern with badges is going to do to us, what checking off boxes um, on meeting ethical standards will do for us rather than reflecting every single day in an organic way on our standards for ethics. So let's use the remaining time I have to emphasize two issues. One of the questions we face that is non-trivial is what to do about the fact that we will all sit in this room, not away, myself included, genuinely agree with the wonderful suggestions that Yuri just made, that the panel this morning uh, made, and so on, and that this will be where our good thinking will end. Last night at dinner, uh, my friends Tony Greenwald, Sharon Shavit, and I discussed the many failed attempts to change research practices. So far, there has been no clear sense of who is responsible for conducting the dialogue and implementing changes. Should it be the scientific societies? Should it be granting agencies? Should it be the journals? Should it be individual editors who choose to have their own standards? Should it be laboratories? Ultimately, should it be the people? I think haphazard attempts have been made over the years. Voices in the wilderness, many of whom I know, have suggested that we stop certain kinds of practices. I've heard, you know, ad nauseum, the let's not report p-values, let's report confidence intervals, let's report effect sizes, that we should report experiments that failed, that we should report exploratory work, that every journal should at a minimum have supplementary materials uh, that can be put on a website and so on. But human behavior, as anybody who studies human behavior will tell you, can be hard to change in many of the situations that to me resemble very much what we face here when we talk about research integrity. Let's take two examples of behavioral change that were sought using similar kinds of methods to each other, one that succeeded and one that failed. On the question of donating organs, you and I know that what separates the evil countries where only four to 20% of people, citizens, donate their organs versus the Mother Teresa-like countries where nearly 100% of people donate their organs. We know what distinguishes them. We know that it is not the quality of how well their mothers teach them about generosity and charity and so on. Uh, we know that it doesn't have to do with whether those countries are socialist or capitalist in orientation but something as simple as the manner in which the question is posed. To produce low levels of organ donations, you should simply say, if you wish to donate your organs, please mail this postcard in. Okay? But to produce high levels of organ donation, you should say exactly the same sentence with one additional word. You should say, if you do not wish to donate your organs, please mail this postcard in. The smart choice that results in the second of these two conditions emerged because of a clear-eyed observation of a very simple fact. Human beings do not mail postcards. Okay? <laughs> the majority of people are not against organ donation. They just don't get around to doing it. And you should talk to me about how stupid I was young, when I was young uh, in the amount of money I put away towards retirement, not even thinking about it, which again, like this should have been a default. Um, so I think that this kind of default setting could creatively be considered for those aspects of research where there is broad consensus on the clearly right thing for us to do. In this case, organ donation is good for us. We may have similar sets of things that we all agree on, and we could use this. But we worry that it will still not happen um, unless we do something that Alex Rothman, this, in the morning session today, he asked, a, I think, a very astute question, and, and Alex suggested that we use the existing, our existing science, our own field, on behavioral change to understand how to go about doing this. My own worry is that there's another example of default setting that failed recently that we would want to avoid. This was Mayor Bloomberg's hope that by setting an eight instead of 16 ounce cup of sugar water sold in New York City, that he could make that great city even greater. I'm with Mayor Bloomberg on this, but as you know, the measure failed miserably, because in this case, 
the act of setting a default was viewed as paternalistic, as patronizing, and an affront to the basic American right to a large soda. <laughs> Take your stingy hands off my pitcher of Coca-Cola, the people said, and a judge agreed. The difference between the many experiments that show success and failure to change behavior may be important to us here when we think about research integrity. To what extent should particular aspects of the research process be required? We have many requirements right now when we submit papers, so it's not like this would be setting a precedent. We could have some more requirements if we believe that that's the right thing to do. To what extent, on the other hand, should these things be freely chosen? with built-in reputational rewards for those who choose to act to improve research integrity. On the one hand, we would be more like the organ donation case. Who doesn't believe in making science have the greatest integrity? Who doesn't want their own lab and their own studies to have been done in a way that adheres to the highest standards of ethics? So we should, by setting defaults, be able to shape our behavior to be in line with what we ourselves want. Would that work? I think it's worth doing experiments to see if this indeed is a simplistic idea, and there already are some data on this, so this is not a completely new idea, and in fact, uh, a collaborator of mine, Yuval Feldman, and I are doing this in the context of legal sorts of, um, of, of rules to see how much people will obey when it's imposed versus freely chosen and so on. Um, but there are many ways in which our situation here is quite different from organ donation, which actually requires just one act of inaction to produce the right outcome. Whereas for us, that's not gonna be the case. We're gonna have to do many things. So there'll be actually uh, many actions we're gonna have to take, including uh, putting things in places where they can be transparently observed and so on. Now, do we have any examples of behavior change in this domain that we can look to in our past and see if it actually did work? And indeed there is, and it goes back again to Stanley Milgram. It's the creation of IRBs, which did change the lives of social scientists. That was imposed. Now, I have no doubt that even those of you who may be frustrated with your own IRBs understand that we must have some form of oversight over our work. That scientists, because of their ego involvement in their own research, are surely compromised in coming to the right conclusion about the merits of their study that to ask a scientist to determine the cost-benefit ratio of their work for society is like asking a scientist to vote on whether their own paper should be published in their chosen journal. The fact about IRBs is that they didn't come about because the scientists called for them. They were imposed by lawmakers who came to be suspicious of the potential harm of social science and biological science. Five decades later, it should be our hope that questions of research integrity will be debated and adjudicated by us, by members of our own community, rather than for us to wait for Senator Grassley to impose them on us. So in conclusion, I'm just gonna remind us of something the physicist uh, Max Planck said. He's credited with being the creator of the field of quantum physics, and he said something about scientific truths that I believe also applies to truths about the process of doing uh, scientific research and scientific integrity. He said, a new scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. Of course, the responsibility for research integrity must always rest with the director of a laboratory, but I think that younger generations may see more clearly that we are the descendants of great people who participated for the first time in history in experiments to empirically study the mind and its limits. That they will recognize that social psychology has to be the science that must be at the forefront here because it is the science that has taught us the most about the frailties of moral and ethical decisions. Change will also happen because of specific acts of boldness that create places like the Center for Open Science that is led by Brian Nosek. I have never removed articles of clothing in public speaking venues, but I will do so now in support of the Center for Open Science, which exists for us, and make a simple assertion. Use it. And here is the Center for Open Science.